We'll, we'll get started. My name is Ryan Stowers. I'm executive director of the Charles Koch Foundation. I'm, I'm very honored to be hosting this panel and, and moderating this panel. I'm, I'm excited to give my colleagues a chance to introduce themselves. This panel is, is titled Individualized Pathways for a New Era of Learning. And so we're gonna talk about pathways to learning. We wanna create a provocative uh, discussion for you. And, and uh, so again, thanks for being here. It's, it's, it's so inspiring to be uh, somewhere where you can actually shake hands and rub shoulders or, or touch, touch elbows rather, um, and uh, be in person. So it's, and it's also inspiring to be at a conference full of people that are really trying to break down the barriers that learners face. It, 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 is, it is inspiring. And, I represent a philanthropic organization that's, that's trying to identify groups that are doing just that and invest in them. And, and so I, I'm just, I'm very inspired to be here. And thanks again for, for attending. Um, I'm gonna ask my colleagues to introduce themselves when they address the first question, if that's okay. So just to keep it simple. Um, but I'm very excited to, to, to have them with us. What I want to do to open up is I'm going to answer the question that I'm going to ask them. I, I get, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to answer the question from my perspective first, and then, and then I'll give them a chance to, to do that as well. But what do we mean when we say a new era of learning? And uh, this is, again, just my perspective and the Charles Koch Foundation's perspective. But I think what we're, what we're talking about is really moving away uh, aggressively from the one-size-fits-all, um, top-down approach that we've had in the past. Um, one that uh, basically to create a, a, a dynamic landscape of learning options that, is, that, that are highly individualized, learning options that allow and empower people to discover who they are and then based on who they are, develop the knowledge and skills that will help them connect to real opportunities to create value for, the, for themselves and for others. And I think that nuance is really important and I hope that it, that it comes out in, in some of the solutions that we talk about and, and, and some of these, the experts that we have on the stage um, are all, all, all heavily engaged in this space. Um, it's also, I just wanted to point out that I think the timing's critical. We're kind of at a watershed moment and there's a real opportunity to, to either um, drive change that's gonna be transformative, that's gonna be um, focused on empowering individuals to reach their full potential, or we could uh, miss that opportunity and kind of just tweak at the margins and, and uh, adjust things, make, make the current system perhaps a little bit better on some margins. And I think that's, I think that's really um, something that we need to face and address. I think it's critical that we accelerate change and innovation that we can't return from. We've got an opportunity to really drive change and, and approach learning in a much more individualized way. I think the other risk that I wanted to point out is um, sometimes we conflate innovation with technology. And as important as technology is, the real innovation that needs to occur is the way that we think and act about learning. Breaking down the, the barriers between work and learning and, and really approaching learning in a, in a much more individualized way. So that's how, I'm, that's how I think this new era of learning needs to be looked at and, and addressed. And I wanna hear, hear from my colleagues. So I'll turn the time over to you. I don't care which order you go in. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. And Mimi, do you wanna go? They're all shaking their heads, so I guess I'll <laughs> yeah, go first. Mimi. So what does a new era mean to you? Um, so my name is Mimi Rosado. I'm actually a Department of Navy employee. Um, but I am very fortunate to have probably one of the only jobs where I get to engage with um, different universities and nonprofits in finding different pathways to work, um, which is amazing that the Navy's even looking at that. Um, so the way I define it is to, um, the new era for me is to find and create situations where learners can engage in different methods outside of just the classroom and just outside of employment. Right, so I don't know how many of you remember when you were younger, you used to go to sixth grade camp, or you know, you went to summer camp or whatever that was, and having the opportunity to learn the social skills, having the opportunity to be the team lead, you know, of some basketball camp that you went to. Um, I'm five two, so I never went to basketball camp, but <laughs> if you did, having that opportunity. Um, 
and introducing and injecting those types of opportunities both in the workplace and in the classroom so that students aren't just trying to obtain knowledge out of books and out of sessions and Zoom sessions and things like that. So, uh, for example, matching up mentors with students, right, because you can learn a lot of those experiences. Or at work, creating, um, what do they call it, the dating that you do mentorship, the speed dating type mentorship or the speed dating type of um, environment. So just being able to create those situations so that, because everybody learns differently, um, so that they can explore, discover their own power in learning, right? Because a lot of times people don't have the opportunity to, to experience that. Um, and then being open to allowing those individuals to then um, provide that power to other people, right? So it's giving people the power back to take control of their own learning in different situations. So that, to me, that's what it is. It's outside of the classroom and outside of the employers. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Josh Jarrett. I've got a couple hats I wear here. Uh, I'm the founder and chair of the Skill Up Coalition, which is a nonprofit effort that we created last summer to help COVID-impacted frontline workers get rapidly reskilled into in-demand careers through re short-term reskilling. I've been fortunate to have the support of the Charles Koch Foundation. Uh, and recently also uh, joined uh, Wiley as the head of strategy, which is a $2 billion global company focused on unlocking human potential, particularly through connecting education to careers. So there's a theme here. Um, I, I'd say sort of four things building on uh, Mimi's point, I agree. I think one is that we need to come to terms with significant labor market discontinuities, right? That the labor market is more out of whack now than it's ever been since World War II and it's not gonna suddenly get better, right? That like, we're gonna have to have more responsive approaches um, because we're gonna have labor market shortages for a long time. We do a lot of work and scale up different communities. The commercial driver's license is like the in most in-demand career in most communities we go into. Registered nurses, right? Like, they're just gonna be rotating set of stuff that we are panicked about. Um, second thing is, I think there's gonna be a big focus on shorter term, right? Shorter term programs, more responsive. Uh, Strata's done some interesting work before COVID. People who are looking to reskill adults, two out of three were looking at degrees. Now one out of three. It's literally flipped. Um, and so I think we're going to have to figure out the short term stuff in a hurry. It's, and it's kind of still the Wild West. Uh, third, much more employer sponsored, much more empl employers being engaged, involved, you know, getting um, not just writing the check, uh, but, but focusing on the content. Uh, and the last, more focus on equity. Um, actually, Wiley just put out a survey uh, today or yesterday looking at the tech community. 70% of employers say that we have a diversity problem. 70% of young tech workers say they have not felt included. And half of them have, have left a job or wanted to leave a job because they haven't felt included. So we're going to have to figure that out at the same time. So I'd say those four things. Uh, agree with all of that. Uh, Mark Andreessen a few months ago was uh, criticized uh, for coming out and saying, uh, that uh, the worst thing a young person can do is sort of pursue their passion. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I want to make sure that when we think about individualized education, that's, that's, that's not what we're talking about, um, because I, I agree in part uh, with, what he's, what, with what he says. Uh, from our standpoint, uh, the key point about individualization is not uh, really the individual, but rather the job. And as we think about, and so following on the labor market discontinuity, which yesterday we learned America uh, passed a milestone to over 10 million unfilled jobs uh, in this country for the, first, for the first time. And yes, millions of those are frontline service jobs that no one wants because they're not paying a living wage, but millions of them are uh, higher skill or mid-skill jobs that uh, are a good first step on the path to a career and that require a series of tech skills or tech stacks or platform skills that are not currently being taught uh, at any scale in the current education ecosystem or at a minimum not being taught alongside the work experience that make those um, graduates uh, employable in these entry level jobs. And so we, um, I'm sorry, Ryan Craig, <laughs> and I'm, I, uh, I'm a, a partner at uh, Achieve, uh, which is a, a private equity firm, and uh, the Koch Foundation is an investor uh, in our workforce fund. And in our workforce fund, we try and make the distinction between what we call an education up approach uh, to closing the skills gap or employability 
versus an employer down approach. And education up is kind of everything that has ever happened to, to this point, <laughs> where a bunch of well-meaning people sit around, uh, typically from the education or training world, sit around a table and ascertain what skills are missing and develop a curriculum and recruit students and run a program and graduate students and then kind of hope and pray they find jobs. <clears throat> and uh, that is not working. Uh, so we are, we are focused on what we call an employer down approach where you start with an intermediary uh, who has access to the employers we're talking about. When we say an employer, employer engaged, employers aren't going to engage themselves. They have a hundred other things to do. As we've seen, they have, uh, they're quite willing to keep 10.1 million jobs unfilled, um, even though it may not be in their long-term uh, interest to do so. Um, so we are very focused on trying to identify intermediaries who can sort of stand between the current education ecosystem and the world of employment and design these employer down pathways where you're literally providing uh, a training program that is almost job specific and perhaps even employer specific for that specific employer and removing friction for the candidate, right? Why don't millions of people just go out and get these tech skills, platform skills, and business skills that employers are seeking, primarily because they the cost of upskilling and the uncertainty of the employment outcome. If you could el eliminate both of those frictions, you'd have millions of people going out and getting these skills. And then likewise, why aren't employers hiring? You know, we call that hiring friction. It's, it's uh, the reduced propensity of employers to uh, hire candidates who don't have, you know, proven experience with that job. It's why quote unquote entry level cybersecurity jobs, if you look at the skills required for those jobs, are effectively asking for three years of experience in the space. Entry level it's jobs. It's more than that. Yeah. <laughs> it's become oxymorons in the space. And so we really need intermediaries to step up and run these employer down models. And to the point about individualized, if you run an employer down approach where you're you're essentially customizing a a, a training program for a specific employer in a specific job, those are individualized pathways and those lead to socioeconomic mobility. Yeah, no, that's good. So I'm gonna, in the attempt to be provocative, um, passion, you kind of you kind of canceled that out, yeah. and and I get it. No because, passion, because uh, you can't make money on being passionate. Um, well, you can, but, you, but 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 not always. And I, I get that point. But how do we? Isn't there a way? I guess, and I'd love to I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Isn't there a way to connect with passion as long as it includes? something that is economically, um, th that's something that's connected to them, um, learners being able to create value for themselves and others, basically. So, I, the, so, so we have a company, um, in the, our prior firm is called University Ventures, um, called Yellow Brick, which is uh, short, online, cheap career discovery courses in passion areas for millennials and Gen Z, and they run programs in sports and fashion and beauty and sneakers and streetwear and film and TV and so forth. And the idea is for $500, you can figure out if you can make a career here and roadmap to get a job and, or figure out if, if in fact a post-secondary program of any kind makes, even makes sense for you. That's a good investment. What's probably not a good investment is a you know, four-year degree program costing $100,000 or a two-year master's program costing you know, $150,000 run by Columbia University. Uh, that is, that's, you know, um, so it's all a question of, you know, investment of time and ex exactly. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Then we agree. I thought we disagreed. Right. <laughs> Sorry. If I, just add, <laughs> if I can add to that, I mean, the three questions I, I ask young people to ask themselves is, what am I passionate about? What am I good at? And what will somebody pay me to do? And that you can actually, you want to end up in the bullseye eventually, but you should try, you know, you can come at that problem from any one of those points. And oftentimes, starting with one of the other two questions is a much more pragmatic approach. Especially if you're not sure what the, your passion is, you need to try on some things. I mean, we, we, we have a company that is a, essentially an employer down model where most of their clients are in the insurance space. And the reality is that there are very few 22 year olds who are excited about a career <laughs> in insurance. But if you provide them with a frictionless pathway into that role, many of them will find their home in that industry, in a space and in a role, in a job that they actually love or use it as a launching off point for something else. So I'm glad that you said that because I think part of that education process is to teach the students how to maneuver whatever company they end up at to find something that they're passionate about 
even if they can only get 20% of their job to do something they really love, it's almost like they'll have a better success rate at doing the other 80%, right? So I'll use myself as an example. I work in an engineering lab. I never took engineering in, in school. Um, I'm a female, I work with a lot of military, which I was not in the military. Um, on paper, I should not be where I am. Um, but the fact that I kind of said, well, I wanna work with kids and I love working, you know, I came from the ghetto, so I wanna work with like underprivileged kids and you know, people like me, um, eventually, you know, I started taking the side jobs at my job, right? You start adding in the extra time and really doing the passion and eventually, um, you can convince somebody to then pay you your full-time job in doing what you're passionate about, right? But it was learning from mentors how to maneuver that system so that you could eventually get there. It almost, like you could see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and I think that's not what we're teaching a lot of these learners. We're teaching them the technical skills and things like that, but we're not incorporating um, how to live within the system. Um, and so they get lost, they get disencouraged, and then they drop out of whatever job that could have eventually become something that they could have done very well. Yeah, no, that's really good. And this gets to the, the relationship between work and learning, too, that that all needs to, it all needs to be broken down. It's, you're, it's constant learning, it's lifelong learning. And then the pivoting that you're talking about, if, if we can create methods to make that pivot low cost, then they can pivot, they can learn and experiment right now the cost to pivot is almost catastrophic. It, it, it pushes them out, or, and, and then it, what it does is it creates a lot of dissatisfaction. We've got 70% of people in their jobs that are really frustrated and dissatisfied. That's where I think the, the passion comes in. They've got to love what they do. They've got to see it connected to creating value for, for, for others. So someone, I can't remember which one of you mentioned employers. It's a really important part of of driving the change that we want to see, because until we get um, those signals from the demand side, we're not, we're not going to see that, at least my perspective is, we're not going to see the, the change that we need to occur. So my question for you all is, do employers know what they want in this, in this case? And how can we begin to address this gap? Because I think it's, it's really important. So if I can start with that one. I think employers. You are an employer. I am an yeah. employer, and I, you know, and this is very frustrating to me. Um, so I've, and this is not just from the Navy perspective, because I did work for a lot of consulting firms, and I worked for the University of California before that. And so, in in every industry, employers know what they want. I think sometimes they're not realistic about what's available, right? So as an employer, it's almost like, and I, I live in analogy, so I apologize for this, but um, it's almost like you want a partner in life who is good looking, they make good money, um, they don't complain about any of your faults, and their breath is always beautiful, right? So it's like, you know what you want, and whether you're really going to find that or not is a different question, right? So I think employers do know what they want. I think it's, they need a reality check sometimes. And that's where these bridging programs, like what you were talking about, that's what helps, right? Because they're kind of like the person, the friend that introduces you to the person that may meet eight out of your 10 things on your list that you have. Mine has about 55 things on it, but you know, they help you find that, that person. They're, the, they're like the match.com of employers and, and education. And so, um, employers, what frustrates me is that employers, sometimes, for example, when we put out position descriptions, we're asking for 20 years of cybersecurity experience. And I don't even think it's been around that long. So I don't know who we're going to find that has that much experience because that's what we, I don't know why we automatically go to the like, I want the top person. And then in my opinion, it doesn't matter anyways, because even if we found somebody with 20 years, we're just gonna retrain them with the things that, how we do things anyway. So we might as well take a shot on somebody. Um, and so that's where I think the bridging programs, the nonprofits and those kind of folks um, really are imperative, but employers need to be willing to put the focus and the time on it. And I don't think we would have been involved in it if I hadn't threatened my boss that I was gonna leave if he didn't let me do this, right? And so 
you need to almost assign somebody that that's literally what they do as an employer. Like my job is literally to make those partnerships and make those connections because who else has time? Yeah, nobody loses their job at an employer. Very few do because they have left a position unfilled. So you can lose your job if you make a lot of bad hires. <laughs> So, and if you add to the, you know, the increasing cost of a bad hire, you add to that the, you know, the fact that uh, uh, new college and university grads going into a job, probably 50% of those churn within two years, and they're like, well, why should we invest anything in sort of training, onboarding, and so forth? And most employers have come, and actually there's been a major sea change since the, the Great Recession. You know, hundreds of companies, hundreds of large companies sort of abandoned their entry-level training program. So now, you know, it's basically restricted to the very elite companies, the McKinsey's and Goldman Sachs of the world, and the U.S. military. Um, but beyond that, you know, your, your Fortune 500, your mid-sized companies, they don't, they want, they want candidates who are going to be productive in those roles from day one. And if they can't find them, they just leave them un, unfilled. So it's very, it's very hard. So do they know what they, what they want? Like, yes and, yes and no. They, they, they know, but they're, they're not, they're not finding <laughs> what they what they want. I'd, I'd take it one step further and say they, they think they know what they want and they're actually wrong. Um, which is if you look at the, de the degree requirement inflation that's happened on jobs that uh, you know, don't require it, never have required it. And if you require a degree on your jobs, you eliminate about 65% of African American applicants, about 70% of Latinx uh, uh, applicants. And so you've got to take that off. And so one of the things that I, I, I totally don't like and Forces being filmed is uh, skills-based hiring. I think it's a crock um, in, in that I think it's good because it is making employers say, oh, there's this new way and we're going to do skills-based hiring. But no one's ever done skills-based hiring except in a few narrow places. They're, they are proxy-based hires. We've used the degree as the proxy and we need new bundles. New bundles that are bigger than a bunch of uh, uh, atomic skills because nobody thinks about, oh, I'm going to hire somebody to this atomic skill and that atomic skill. They look for a bundle of experiences or a bundle of who they are. Um, and so I think that's what the challenge is, is how do we build those right bundles that are, that are less than a degree and bigger than a, than a Chinese menu of skills. Yeah, skills-based hiring only works if it's actually skills-based hiring through the entire hiring funnel. So think about hiring in terms of a funnel, right? You have the top of funnel where you have a job posting online that produces 1,000 applicants, 1,000 resumes for that job. And how is the review done at the top of the funnel? No human being is looking at 1,000 resumes. It's all being done by applicant tracking system. You're literally doing keyword-based matches against the resume. So are you doing skills-based hiring at the top of the funnel? No one is. No one is because you're, you're, it's all the keywords in the job description that are degree and experience and so forth. It's the bundles that Josh is talking about. Uh, are they doing skills-based hiring mid-funnel and bottom of the funnel? Sure. Of the 20, can 20 of 1,000 candidates they actually talk to, like, I have no doubt that they're looking at the skills on the resume, maybe even giving assessments to those 20, but that's not where the skill, that's not where the hiring funnel is broken. It's broken at the top of the funnel where we have a, you know, primitive keyword-based matching uh, technology uh, that is privileging uh, degrees and wealth and so forth. Yes, and in the 80 percent of the hiring decisions made in the first 30 seconds of an interview, and so that's not skills based. That's that's called mini me hiring. Mm -hmm. Does this person remind me of myself at that age? And so there's some skills involved, but I'd say we're even pretty far away in the middle and the end of the funnel. So I would say one of the ways that we do hiring there at the lab where I work is probably could be replicated with other employers. Unfortunately, not a lot of the U.S. Navy is able to do this, but but we we have been authorized to do this where we do name select hiring. And the goal of that is not posting a position that then you have thousands of people applying for. What you do is you find the person that matches the culture and the, the learning hunger, right? And that, and that entrepreneurship and all those things that you're looking for um, and then find a project to put them on. Mm -hmm. And so when we do our student hiring, that's what we're looking for. We're saying, okay, we want this person at our organization. Now let's go figure out where we can place them. And that's a, like you reverse engineer that whole process because what you end up with is somebody that no matter what of the 600 projects you put them on, 
they're going to excel. And then they can move around because they're not just, you're not hiring them just for that one position, you're hiring them for the organization. And then they can move around and, and you can place them wherever because they have all of the right soft skills, they have all of the right communication and all those other things. I mean, if we could replicate that, we, our problems would be solved uh, because that's, you know, then you're a true learning human capital development organization investing in entry level training. Um, Unfortunately, we've moved away. The rest of the economy has pretty much moved away from that. Um, My contact information is probably <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> so you're, you are an anomaly, Mimi, so, um, which is awesome. We can, we can learn and replicate anomalies. So um, seems like there's a role for ed providers, a role for um, employers, but there's also a role for intermediary organizations. Can we just talk about what that looks like, knowing that we can't automatically replicate what Mimi's done. So how can we, how can we drive change given, given these gaps, given the dynamics, and what role do in intermediaries play? Well, there are, there are a bunch of different categories. I mean, you, at, the, at, the, at a uh, very minimal level, you have sort of the idea of work integrated learning, uh, where you have actual projects from real employers. And we have a company called Ripen, uh, which is serving up these, these projects and helping colleges and universities integrate these real world projects from real employers into coursework and as capstone projects and so forth. They're offering them through career services as virtual internships. So that's a form of intermediary. And it can go as far as sort of full on apprenticeship like models where you're hiring from day one, you're paying from day one, you're training, and you're doing sort of what Mimi said, which is like, we know this person is capable, will be capable in time, and we're gonna invest in training and this person, and ultimately, we're going to deploy this person in some capacity, whether it be a business service or solutions, and ultimately, probably pass them on to a client um, and throughput that talent to a, to a client. And that's, th those are the, um, the new models that we're, we're very focused on investing in, and we've done it in software development, data, financial services, medical devices, um, instructional design, cybersecurity, Salesforce, and uh, we want to do it in like eight more sectors in the next couple of years to prove that we can do that um, and hopefully redefine the idea of what an apprenticeship is, because if you think apprenticeship in the U.S. is pretty much restricted to the building and construction trades, and that they do incredible things for the half million Americans who are enrolled in those programs, mostly union run in those sectors, but in the tech and healthcare and financial services and other sectors that are growing even faster than the building and construction trades and where the jobs of the future are, there really aren't sort of natural, there aren't unions and there aren't sort of natural intermediaries in those spaces to bridge the gap. And so we're, we're trying to find the best positioned businesses or organizations to sort of run these programs and run a similar playbook. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's a, uh, absolutely, I think those pathways are really critical. Uh, Wiley's got a, a one called M3, which, you know, basically Morgan Stanley would say, I need 50 developers and we'll go recruit, train, place and mentor for two years. And instead of embedding education in this vessel we call a degree, we're actually embedding in this vessel we call a human who's effective doing the work. And so we're actually you know, shortening the, the gap between the learning and, and the utility. Um, so that's a really good example that employer-backed programs like Ryan's doing so much pioneering work on. But we need intermediaries further upstream. So like what SkillUp does is, think of, to go back to March 2020. 40 million people on unemployment. You just lost your job. Where do you do? Where do you go? Right? Do you go to American Job Center, if you know those exist? Well, they're all been shuttered. Do you go to Google search bar? Or do you go to your cousin and ask, like, what should I do? Right? There's no mechanism to figure out these short-term pathways, and we need to help people curate those pathways, help them pick the ones that are a good fit for them based on their local labor market economy, based on who they are, based on the quality of these providers. It's the Wild West. There's very little quality standards in a lot of this stuff. Um, and, and we've got to celebrate the employers who are doing it right and these pathways that are producing. I mean, the best skill-up partners get... 80 plus percent completion rate, 80 plus percent uh, placement rates, and you know, uh, uh, economic gains of $20,000 a year, right? Can you go from making $20,000 a year pre-COVID to $40,000 a year six months later? Like it's possible, it's, it's small, these programs and curated. So I think we need the, the support to curate high quality programs and pathways, wraparound supports, they need to be financial supports, operational support, and help people doubt their own self-doubt. 
right? We need coaching and like career navigators is the, is the WPA job, the work project administration job of the, this century, I think. Um, and we need outreach, right? If you build it, they will not come. We need to help, um, SkillUp's about to launch a new website focus on earn and learn opportunities. These ones where you can get a job now and with a pathway of learning, they're testing off the charts with workers, particularly trying to reduce their risk. Um, so I think that's a, a couple places intermediaries play. Are you ready for some provocative? Yeah, give it to us. <laughs> so I would like to challenge um, the folks in that space, right? I can't pronounce intermediaries. Um, challenge them in the sense that, you know, I've been very fortunate because I'm here in San Diego. And I'm very fortunate to have experienced recently three different organizations working together for the regional success. And I don't think that that happens enough, no. right? And so, for example, I'm on a, um, I just had an, a meeting earlier today, I was sitting up in the third floor, and it's the Cyber Center of Excellence, right? Which is a, a nonprofit. It's the San Diego Economic Development Corporation and the San Diego Workforce Partnership. Three completely different organizations with different, different but similar goals, right? They have different spaces, but they have the same goal. The three of them have partnered with employers like us and with different um, education um, um, schools, you know, schools and universities in San Diego, and we have collectively um, come together to figure out how to spend a grant that one of them got um, called Cyber Hire Initiative, right? And it's the employers, it's the education, and it's the three organizations that have equal ground and equal um, goals, you know, they, they have the same stake, and we're helping each other figure that out. And I don't think that that happens enough. It's not gonna, you know, I don't know how much infighting or inbounding there is regionally, but, you know, a region can really benefit from, you know, getting the, um, the economic development corporations that are out there in different cities and the nonprofits and schools and, and really figuring out how to do that. And it doesn't matter that the grant came into one of the organizations. The other two are helping them because collectively San Diego is going to benefit. Our citizens are going to benefit. So um, that is my high-heeled hippie kind of structure to it. But, but it's working, right? It's, it's actually happening here in a large city, which is unheard of. No, I mean, the San Diego Workforce Board is one of our, the very few high-performing workforce boards uh, in, the, in the country. Our workforce development system is broken. Um, and that doesn't, you won't, you won't see that happening in most, in most markets, unfortunately. But I think the, you know, the, 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 the metaphor I like is one of friction. So what is an intermediary? An intermediary is someone, is an entity that essentially reduces the friction between the candidate and that good first job uh, effectively. And you can do that by reducing financial risk, reducing the uncertainty of the, uh, of the, of the job, actually hiring them, and you can reduce friction for the end employer as well by giving them the opportunity to try the talent before they're being asked to buy or hire that uh, talent or, you know, and anything, Less than that is, you know, helpful and so forth. But those are, and intermediaries can be for-profit companies like the ones we're buying and investing in, or they can be nonprofits, or they can be uh, public uh, entities. Can play these uh, play these roles. But if you look across, for example, uh, Central Europe, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, where you have apprenticeship programs, that's sort of what these intermediaries are. They're, um, you know, trade associations or organizations that are sort of quasi-public that have been around for a century or longer that sort of run these programs on behalf of you know, six or 10 or 20 employers in a given industry in a given uh, region and are through putting that talent through to, uh, through to employers. But it is a, you know, this gap is really a many to many problem. There are thousands of uh, schools producing talent uh, that's not job ready and you have millions of employers and no single uh, school can sort of navigate or manage that number of relationships and no employer is interested in doing that. And so you need someone, an entity to stand between them and you know, help to bridge that gap. I like the bridging metaphor as well. Yeah, I, I think what Ryan just outlined, I, I, I think what you stated, Mimi, the power of partnership is underrated. And I think it sounds idealistic, and maybe San Diego is, is again, an anomaly. You're just creating anomalies everywhere. But, we have beautiful weather. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I think that kind of partnership is the only way to solve the, the problems that Ryan's describing. It's, it's finding 
groups with aligned vision and complementary capabilities and then, and then experimenting and going after it. And I think Skill Up is actually a, a micro laboratory of a, a, exactly that. You're partnering with a whole host of different types of organizations to solve a really big problem and it's working. So I think we've got to, I think we've got to, um, this gets back to this kind of culture of, of innovation that we've got to embrace ourselves. We've got to think and act differently. And I think partnerships is going to be critical. So I'm, I'm really glad that you, you brought that up. So um, I think, but it's, it's interesting that you know, there's really no, I didn't hear a, a traditional higher education institution in that mix. Actually it is. Oh, yeah. there is? Okay. Yes. So, the, so there's the employer side. Um, and then there's also, for example, San Diego Workforce Partnership has a relationship with UCSD Extension for their income sharing agreement That's program, right. Yeah. right? And so Cyber Hire Initiative is looking at how that is set up so that we can establish the same type of uh, programs. And it's not just universities. Um, there's a huge role that the community colleges are playing in that initiative also, because in San Diego, if we truly want to give the underrepresented communities an opportunity, um, going to the community colleges is a way to do that, right? Because they then move on to the four-year universities. And so they're, they have a huge role in that initiative. Right. Ideally, though, that partnership wouldn't be sort of with the continuing ed or extended ed on the side. It would actually be with the core institution. You'd be able to provide those pathways to the you know, tens of thousands of students who are actually coming through the front door of those institutions, ideally. Or, yeah, that, or, that yeah. particular program yeah. is that way, but yes, they, yeah. you know, you got CSU San Marcos, you got SDSU, you got all of those schools. Or create it outside and then drive competition in a way where, where the, the big schools get on board. Well, that's what, that's what we're, we're banking on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, one so, has ever, no one has ever gone broke betting against the pace of change in higher education. <clears throat> uh, we're going to change that. We're going to change that. So uh, we've only got a couple of minutes, but um, last question, I want you to um, just give a brief response to this, but say we're successful at some level and we've got um, highly individualized pathways, um, skills and competency-based um, hiring that's occurring, all these pieces fall into place. What are the risks? What are the risks of, of um, getting what we're, what we're all hoping for? I mean, I talked about this in my, in my last book that, you know, we lose discovery, we lose serendipity, uh, we lose fun. I mean, there's lots that, and, I, and, I, and, and my, my response is for the 60 to 70 percent of Americans who are matriculating into a post-secondary degree program and not attaining a positive economic outcome, that's acceptable. We, can, we need to solve the economic, stop the economic bleeding and then address those issues. So after the fact, but the fact that we've you know, our higher education in America has gone from our engine of socioeconomic mobility to a break on socioeconomic mobility needs to be, needs to be solved. But I think there are, there are absolutely casualties as, you know, and then finally, you know, the fact that these institutions um, who are likely to lose, that are likely to lose enrollment are, you know, economic engines in their own communities and the impact on those communities and so forth. For the employer, I think with the rise in professional nomads, right, where folks are starting to move around as they discover themselves, right, kind of like when people used to travel back in the 70s. Um, I think we have the risk of, because people are doing continuous learning, of finding better opportunities as they learn more, right? And so you have, to, you have that natural risk. It's like buying your teenager that you don't want to leave home a car, right, and teaching them how to drive. So I, I think from an employer perspective, we have to stay comfortable with the fact that somebody not, may not be with us for more than five years. Um, and that's a risk to us, right? Because we're giving them opportunity to learn in the way that is best for them, but at the same time, now they've learned in the best way that's for them and they might find other opportunities. Um, but we have to get comfortable with that continuous attrition. And I don't think that big organizations like the Navy are comfortable with that. Um, yeah, but majority of organizations aren't. That's a great point. I didn't mean to cut you off, Mimi, but just. Um, I'd say two risks. One is that we lose the, the, the humanistic, I call them horizontal competencies, right? What are those deeper competencies you're building, right? The, the average 18 year old is going to live to be 100. They think that maybe the first person to live to 150 has already been born. So the idea that we're going to like give you one burst of learning and that's going to carry you for that job that's going to be 60 years from now. So like, how do we build those competencies over time? Um, I think that's one risk. I think another risk is we get these sort of fragmented, short pathways. Like that's more cracks, more cracks in the system, more friction potentially, and more equity issues if we don't figure out how to how to 
uh, spackle over some of those cracks because we're actually fragmenting things. The good thing about, and we'll, we'll end on this, the, the good thing about those cracks, to me it sounds like incredible opportunities for entrepreneurs to step up and, and I think that's the way we've all got to think about this. Incredible opportunity for bottom-up solutions to step up and really fill those gaps. That's what ASU GSV is all about. So I think we're five seconds left. That's a good way to end. Thank you so much for, for coming. <laughs>